In Matthew 14, we're told that after Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fishes, that he sent his disciples away on a boat. Jesus went away to practice principle seven. He went to have a quiet time with God and to pray. Shortly before dawn, as the boat was being tossed about, the disciples saw what appeared to be a ghost. They were terrified. Jesus immediately said, do not be afraid. It's me. Peter jumps up and says, Lord, if it is you, bid me come. Jesus held out his hand. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. Oh, what I would give to have, the kind of faith it took to get out of the boat I'm in, into the crashing waves, step out of my comfort zone into the realm of the unknown where Jesus is, and he's holding out his hand, but the waves are calling out my name, and they laugh at me, reminding me of all the times I tried before and failed, the waves keep on telling me time and time again, you'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. This is for my glory. I will choose to listen to the voice of truth. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ that came into recovery because I was drowning in alcoholism and starving myself to death with an eating disorder. My name is Karnan. Every time I heard the lyrics to this song, I cried from grief and despair. I knew recovery was possible. I'd seen it in others. I just wasn't sure that it could be mine. I was born to two young parents in 1969. We never attended church regularly, but my mom always made sure I attended Bible school and was involved in the Christmas and Easter programs in the nearby church. It was during this time that I learned about Jesus. I knew he'd come to save me from my sins, but the churches I grew up in taught hellfire and brimstone, not a God of love. I wasn't quite sure what it was all about, but I wanted to do everything I could to please God and go to heaven. Eventually, we started going to family church as a family. I was baptized in 1969 alongside my mom and dad. I had what I was considered a normal childhood. From a very young age, I remember being a people pleaser. As time passed and I've worked, worked the steps, I feel being a people pleaser was brought on by an incident in the fourth grade girls' bathroom. We had been comparing our parents' ages and one of the girls turned around to me and said, your parents are too young. Are you sure they wanted you? Pandora's box was opened. The feelings would follow me into my adult life and would lead to some very bad choices. At school, I was involved in choir, orchestra, and cheerleading. I always had a, some type of job, whether it be babysitting or working retail. It wasn't until my first step study that I realized how being so insecure had affected my life. At 17, I was dating a guy, and our relationship got more serious than it should have. I got pregnant. I was scared to death. There was no way I could tell my parents. That was not even an option. Besides, I was too young to have a child. The guy's dad made and paid for all the arrangements. I was to have an abortion. And I just want to go off script here and stress for younger kids and even young adults, do not second guess your parents' love for you. They are always there for you to share whatever problem you have. And when you go to Planned Parenthood, or if you go to a private doctor, they never cover the mental or emotional effects of an abortion that will follow you through the rest of your life. With all of those emotions stuffed down inside, anger and resentment, my senior year was great. I was thrilled when I was accepted at ORU. But after my first visit to OU, I knew I was sooner born and sooner bred. So I transferred to OU. Surprise, Mom and Dad. Um, while working a summer job, 
I was contacted to interview with a Wall Street stock brokerage firm. I was offered the job and accepted. I could always finish college later. I started out as the manager's assistant, but I wanted more. I took my broker's exam and then my manager's exam. I was one of the first female operations managers for this firm in the state of Oklahoma. My job was stressful, so I started going to the gym to relieve the stress. I lost a few pounds. Well, if a little is good, a lot's got to be better. This is when my compulsion with weight began. I started teaching aerobics nightly and on Saturday mornings. In my mind, teaching was working, so I had to take an additional class to exercise. During this time, I was also church hopping. One night, my mom invited me to attend a revival at their church. What she really meant is preacher is hot. <laughs> what can I say? He was great looking, athletic, a sweet talker, and a minister. What could go wrong? Uh, we got married less than a year later, but our marriage had problems from the first. There was fault on both sides. When he wanted a divorce, I gladly agreed. That doesn't mean that there wasn't guilt and shame that followed with that. After all, marriage was a lifetime commitment. Mine lasted one year and four months. With more emotions stuffed down, I continued to teach aerobics and lost an unhealthy amount of weight. With strong encouragement from my family and friends, I consented to being admitted into the Laureate Eating Disorder Unit. Here, I learned that once I reached a healthy weight, since I drank and had a compulsive personality, the alcohol could be an issue. I couldn't see that alcohol would ever be an issue in my life. I owned my own home. I was educated. I had a great job. Alcoholics were homeless lived under bridges, and were irresponsible, or at least I thought. I was coming home from a New Year's Eve party in 1989 at 8.45. I made an illegal U-turn less than a half a mile away from my home. When the officer asked if I'd been drinking, I said, oh yeah, but don't worry, I'm headed home before the crazies get out. He did not worry, he arrested me. That was my first DUI. I began dating a man steady that I'd known and worked with for years. Before Jerry and I got married, we agreed not to have children. He had two adult children from his previous marriage, and I was turning 40 the month after we got married, so it seemed okay to me. And I will add at this uh, point, Jerry was an agnostic Jew, but still, in my mind, I had everything I could ever want. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. He will direct your path. It seems the more successful my life began, became, the more I started drinking. All the while, I was feeling guilty for the drinking and starting to hide it. I was using alcohol to cover up the pain of my past mistakes. 2003 was a nightmare. I was drinking more and more. I was sent home from work for smelling of alcohol, the job I thought I loved. After finding a water bottle full of vodka, that was the final straw for Jerry. He told me either I got help or he was leaving. Sad to say, but that was one of his many threats. I went back to Laureate, but this time for alcohol. Not long after I finished rehab, I got my second DUI. I kept telling myself if I really wanted to quit drinking, I could. Right now, I just needed to get everyone off my back. I went to Valley Hope for 30 days. I thought that this was going to be the magic that fixed me. I celebrated a year of sobriety. I had been cured. I'd like to say that my story ends here, but sadly it does not. The saying is true, it's not the 38th drink an alcoholic takes, it's the first. I had that one drink and I was out off and running. I was drinking more than ever. I went back to rehab, 
but I was not so lucky this time. I learned while I was in, in there that I'd lost my job of 24 years. My family and friends were tired and frustrated. I've now learned through every relapse that I was depending on myself. The pattern happened more and more than I ever would like to recall. I was in two major accidents and walked away without a scratch. Just more guilt and shame. The truth is, I was only arrested and booked three times on DUIs. I've been taken home by a cop on more than one occasion, sent to the hospital by a stranger on the street in an ambulance, or I got off on a technicality. By now, any time I drank, I got violently ill. My body could no longer tolerate alcohol. My weight had hit an all-time low. I was a mess, but I could not shake the alcoholic craving or obsession. As sick as it sounds, I loved alcohol. I'd gone to CR before, but this time I was willing to try whatever it took to stay sober. I joined the barbecue team, then a step study. At this point, my marriage was barely intact. I had a wonderful group of women in my step study. I began to feel a connection and develop a trust with the women like I'd never known before. I was starting to feel at peace with myself and accept the fact that Christ had forgiven me for all the wrong that I'd done. During this time, I was active in CR, AA, had gone on a mission trip. I'd been to the CR summit several times. But remember Proverbs 3, lean not on your own understanding? I became lax on calling my sponsor, going to meetings. My quiet time was all but gone. I was once again in control. August 18th, 2009 was my rock bottom. I was home, unemployable, undependable, and unlovable. Looking back on that day, the moment it came to an end seemed surreal. I was convinced the only way I could quit drinking was to die. I had thought that before, but now I was contemplating suicide. I had been so consumed with alcohol and my eating disorder that I wasn't seeking the one that could save me. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for your, I am your guard, God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. With God's help, I went to what I pray is my last rehab. I know I'm susceptible to alcohol because of genetics, but I was also holding on to a resentment toward myself. I told you that Jerry and I had agreed not to have children when we got married. Well, that changed. I wanted a child. This is not something I speak of often. It has taken years and several step studies for me to admit. I was mad at myself, mad at Jerry, and mad at God. Letting go of this resentment has taken a load off me. Last August 20th, I celebrated 11 years of sobriety. I'm not saying it's been easy, but with the support of my brothers and sisters in CR, it has been made a lot easier. In my first year of sobriety, I worked on the movie Home Run, which if you haven't seen it, you need to. I helped with the sick and the elderly. I took meetings to a women's shelter and continued to work on the barbecue team and volunteer at CR whenever possible. I've done five more step studies, co-leading three. I started working full time again. I'm still in the stock brokerage business and in all the craziness, I managed to keep my license. Approximately four years ago, I developed an interest in learning to speak my native language, Muscogee Creek. I went to check out the Creek Community Center and what it had to offer. It was almost like CR. I felt like I'd found my second home. I immediately became active in the Creek language classes and all the community gatherings. 
The following August at CR Summit, I learned of a new initiative started by John Baker Saddleback and Saddleback Church leader Rick Warren, Celebrate Recovery Native Nations. Less than two months after coming home from the summit, I was asked to be the CRNN initiative for Southern Hills Baptist. I realize now that principle one was the hardest for me to accept and live by. Realize that I am not God, that I am powerless. I think you would agree God has shown great mercy on my life. Philippians 3, 12 and 13, Paul talks to us about pressing toward our goal. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I will keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus wants me to be and saved me for. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all that I would be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to the future. Well, what lay ahead of me was not what I had planned or expected. While on vacation, April 2018, my husband Jerry took a fall. After laughing at him and with him, I realized he never regained his balance, so I started questioning him about it. It turns out, three days prior to us leaving on vacation, his hands and feet had become numb. We got home approximately 14 days later and immediately got him a doctor's appointment. That afternoon, the test results changed our lives forever. Jerry was diagnosed with a glioblastoma in his brain. Doors were open that we could not have imagined. Within days, we were on our way to MD Anderson. There, it was confirmed that not only was it cancerous, but it was inoperable. We had a tremendous amount of prayer and support from my family, church, and friends. They showed Jerry the love of Christ and what the church truly looks like. They prayed with us, brought us food, took Jerry to doctor's appointments, sat with him, took him to coffee or to lunch. Unfortunately, he had an adverse reaction to the chemo and radiation. He entered the hospital August 19, 2018, with radiation-induced neuropathy. He was unable to walk, sit, or stand on his own, much less do the things that he loved with the passion, such as reading, watching movies, and sports. Jerry was placed in Zero Point, a predominantly Jewish nursing facility. At this time in Jerry's life, the most he could do was listen to his friends and family talk and tell stories. Occasionally, he could find his voice and carry on a conversation. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The last conversation I had with Jerry was assuring him that I would take care of myself, continue with my recovery, and live life to its fullest. After I read Psalms 23, Jerry went to heaven. You see, just day before, one of the administrators walked Jerry through the prayer of salvation. <laughs> that night when I got home, I was overtaken with fear. Was Jerry afraid? Did he really accept Christ? I didn't hear it. Was he cold? Unimaginable questions just kept running through and running through my mind. And I'm not one that says God talks to me audibly, but while I was panicking, just, I mean, I can't explain that feeling, I was covered with a warmth. 
and I heard, it's okay, he's with me. I went to sleep that night in peace and have slept in peace, a peaceful night as far as Jerry was concerned every night since. Jeremiah 29, 11 has a new meaning. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. My future is brighter because of the support of my CR family. I have learned to live a new normal. I continued to work on the barbecue team, or did until COVID came about and we were unable to serve food. I traded food for the potty duty. (laughs) I'm helping keep the bathrooms COVID free, I hope. I co-led the first women's Native Nation step study in the state of Oklahoma. And by the way, I will be co-leading a new women's step study with Melody B. Um, starting November 30th. It's a Monday night at 6.30, and we would love to have any women that aren't in a step study come join us. You can sign up at Grand Central right up front. To the newcomer, remember that if you are willing to put forth the effort, there is a new family and a new way of life to be found at CR. Believe me when I tell you, There is someone here willing to share their story with you to help you with whatever hurt, habit, or hang-up you may have. Satan tells us so many lies. Don't listen to him. Choose to listen to the voice of truth and start tonight to live the life that God intended you to live. Thank you for letting me share.